So now I'd like to welcome Dr. Greg Gerdman from the USA to discuss cannabinoids in neuroprotection, debunking, debunking the new phrenology of reefer madness. Dr. Greg Gerdman is a neuroscientist and educator with expertise in the physiological actions of cannabis and the endocannabinoid system. His PhD dissertation was one of the first studies to discover endocannabinoids cannabinoids, acting as retrograde messengers that regulate synaptic plasticity in the brain, findings that have become a foundation of modern understanding of the ECS and the neuroprotective actions of cannabis. He is a member of international cannabinoid research and professional organisations and receives funding from the National Institute of Drug Abuse, NIDA, and the National Science Foundation. He is extensively published and a vocal advocate to reclaim cannabis as a remarkably safe, whole plant medicine. So please welcome Dr. Greg Gerdman. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lucy, and for the invitation to come to Australia. It's really a great pleasure. Um, I uh, am, have been a college professor for uh, several years at Eckerd College in St. Petersburg, Florida. And I also want to express that I'm in a transition in my life where I'm um, leaving academia and going to be involved with this organization, Three Boys Farm, which is going to be cultivating cannabis and generating cannabis uh, oils and other derived medicines in Florida. So I have an interest um, professionally in, in this, and I think it's an important disclaimer to make. Um, this is probably the most provocative title that I've ever put out there, and I think it's really important to uh, refer uh, strongly to the kinds of fearful uh, talk that has a scientific basis, but the fearful sort of uh, perspective about risks to the human brain during development or otherwise with cannabis, because it's an extraordinarily important topic, and it is usually taken, uh, I think, importantly out of context based on some of the, the biases that, that uh, Justin introduced us to that have long dominated the discourse with um, cannabis. Right. So just a, in the briefest sort of introduction to me, um, I didn't go to graduate school um, to study cannabis. I, I started a pharmacology program at Vanderbilt University in Tennessee and Nashville in 1996. And it was to study neural systems of learning and memory and the cellular basis of how the brain works. And I was in the right place at the right time to understand what was going on with this new biochemical system of the endocannabinoids and really wanted to help explore the molecular physiology of what's going on with these compounds. And I became captivated and I think can legitimately say that in the last 20 years of my life, I, I have thought every single day uh, about contemplating the ways that cannabis works in the body and the way our endocannabinoid system works. Um, and personally to me, this is me in the lab back then, um, personally what came out of the first published study that we had in 2001 was an understanding uh, that the CB1 receptor uh, acts at presynaptic terminals to inhibit the release of glutamate. And this personally was a very big shift for me because it laid such a very clear understanding of the neuroprotective potential for cannabinoids. And at this point of time in the U.S., you know, one could look at the drug czar, the uh, director of the National Drug Control Policy at the time, General Barry McCaffrey, who was prone to theatrics of dropping a huge uh, pile of papers and talking about how it's Cheech and Chong medicine, there's not a shred of, med of evidence that cannabis is, that marijuana is a medicine. And doing the deep dive that one does in a PhD, I was learning so much about the ancient history and, and the, the more modern history of cannabis use, and it really created a big split for me. So I've been interested in this for a very long time. Um, an outline of where I'm going to go, it was very nicely set up by Justin. Um, Two sort of points. I mean, I'm juxtaposing two very important narratives 
in the scientific research of cannabis. And one is that the endocannabinoid system is neuroprotective. And can cannabis use protect your brain? That's a very provocative thing to say. Um, it may be a romantic thing to say, but it's very well steeped in science, that uh, the endocannabinoid system creates a homeostatic response to injury, to excitotoxicity, and that phytocannabinoids, the plant-based uh, molecules from cannabis, do engage the endocannabinoid system and act as neuroprotective agents. And it's important to really dig into this preclinical research because it cr does create an incredible contrast with any presumption that cannabis should be damaging to the brain. I'm going to be reiterating this a lot. There's going to be some redundancy in my talk. But there is a lot of brain imaging studies these days that are hard to understand for the non-expert that are detecting structural alterations in cannabis users. And there are psychological tests, uh, uh, experiments looking to find neurotoxic consequences of cannabis, like psychosis and IQ that Justin mentioned. And I'll have some, I'll reiterate some of his points. And overall, I, I want to emphasize that this first set you know, endocannabinoids are neuroprotective. It's very exciting. It's a very highly consistent and reproducible uh, field, and it is as mainstream as science gets. The lower part, does cannabis use damage the brain? Not only is it highly inconsistent with the first, at least on first principles, you would not expect it to be true, and in my view, the research is inconsistent and is, importantly, very marred by that kind of pernicious institutional bias that comes from the reefer madness era, and we have to come to terms and realize how it has influenced both the research questions and the clinical practice in your country and in mine. And yet, these are the studies that get so sensationalized in the media. Now, it really should not be anybody's surprise that, I mean, we now understand that Cannabis, the cannabinoids, influence every physiological system in the body, as you've just been hearing about. But certainly it has effects on the mind and the brain that captivate us and fascinate us, both attract us and, and make us scared of the consequences of cannabis. Um, and it's always been that way. Uh, this is undeniably what has been uh, the, the root of human fascination with cannabis. Does it, how it makes you high or mellow you out, create some uh, uh, beneficial effects, or how it can lead to a psychotic, psychotic reaction. High doses of THC can be very psychologically distressing. Um, and the question is, does it lead into a descent to more permanent madness, like this image from the 1930s film, Reefer Madness? It is not new. Uh, you just heard a, a nice introduction to sort of the ancient uh, literature, the, the use of cannabis in antiquity is a tremendously fun thing to study. I'll touch on it ever so briefly here, uh, drawing from a, a wonderful publication by uh, Meshulam uh, several years ago, it, referring to what we have as a legacy from the ancient Assyrian culture, just one of dozens of cultures that didn't just dabble with cannabis, but appeared to use it as the major uh, herbal drug product in their pharmacopoeia. And interestingly here, they, they seem to have multiple names for it. Uh, for example, for medical uses, for ritual uses, and this term, ganzingunu, which has been translated uh, as the drug that takes away the mind. You know, translating ancient language is no simple measure, and we don't know exactly how uh, the, what negative connotations were meant by that, but I think we can uh, understand that ideas about cannabis use have been nuanced and have been understood to be biphasic for earlier than recorded history. I've got two things here. Um, so one could take many different approaches to research. It's not that cannabis hasn't been researched in the past 60 years, uh, but the focus of that work in the latter half of the 20th century has not been even-handed really at all. It has been this kind of phenomenon coming from that 1930s propaganda base. How does marijuana make someone stoned or addicted or addicted to other drugs, the so-called gateway idea? How does it make uh, users violent? You saw that graphic from Reefer Madness. That was a moment in that film right before the young man who's been smoking a cannabis cigarette bludgeons a guy to death just because it seems fun to do. Um, these kinds of things have driven research. How does it make you mentally impaired or lead to uh, schizophrenia? And it is out of that very pro pronounced 
negative bias that the discovery of the endocannabinoid system emerged. And that has been a real game changer. So that now, I just cherry pick some interesting influential reviews and articles from the scientific literature. We in the scientific community refer to endocannabinoids and the endocannabinoid system quite regularly as, by terms like this, the stout guards of the nervous system. Endocannabinoid signaling is a synaptic circuit breaker in neurological disease that they're important for traumatic brain injury. The endocannabinoids are referred to as a master regulator of homeostasis and neuroprotection. And again, this is not fringe, it's not coming from the cannabis advocate community, it's coming from the mainstream scientific research uh, all over the world. It's as mainstream as it gets. I say that over and over again. Endocannabinoids are viewed as guardians of the nervous system. They, some of the earliest research, and these are chemical structures showing anandamide and 2-AG, um, it came from uh, injury experiments in animals. Brain injury, you can, uh, I mean, it's Preclinical animal research can be tough. This is stu studies where injury is inflicted upon these animals. And as someone who's done a lot of animal research, it's very important to me that this massive volume of preclinical animal research is taken as relevant to the human experience because that's why it's funded. We know that with physical trauma or seizure in, in uh, animal models, endocannabinoids rapidly elevate. They're a natural response. This was part of the early clues that were coming in the late 90s. And it attenuates many of the uh, seizure activity that comes from injury or from uh, toxic chemicals. It reduces the extent and severity of brain injury following experimentally inflicted head wounds. And I'll show you some other examples in a little bit about stroke. It reduces the severity of inflammation that naturally follows brain injury and has enormous clinical consequences for recovery. But, you know, so what, let's keep thinking about the flip side. If endocannabinoids are an innate system of neuroprotection and it is not controversial that they are, how is it that we should presume plant cannabinoids from smoking marijuana products to be damaging to the brain? Well, maybe. In some cell culture systems, CB1 receptors can promote reactive oxygen species. You just heard some of that. And it is an important scientific question. It could contribute to cellular oxidative stress under certain situations or it could contribute to the tumor fighting capacity of the endocannabinoid system. So the when and the where of that cannabinoid receptors contribute to cellular oxidative stress is a very important area of research. And I wanna point out this issue of the tumor fighting capacity of endocannabinoids and the cannabinoid receptors, that is the singular place where the research has been very reproducible. Cannabinoids have a cytotoxic effect to many tumor cells and a, cyto, a simultaneously cellular protective effect to healthy neurons and other brain cells and other cells in the body. That is an exquisitely fascinating question as a scientist, and uh, it's also, of course, incredibly important for looking at this as a, as a therapeutic um, some other points of, of differences to consider on this question of, okay, if endocannabinoids are protective, how could they also be a problem? When you'll hear this dialogue if you really dig into the policy conversations. Well, the endocannabinoid system is a synapse-specific signaling mechanism in cells. When a cell is activated, it releases endocannabinoids to fine-tune its synaptic inputs, its cell cellular levels of activity. Compare that to when you... Uh, ingest cannabis and the, the, there's a pharmacokinetic sort of swamping the system, you lose the specificity. That may be real, it is very likely relative, uh, relevant and mechanistically important for some of the uh, you know, acute inebriating effects and the effects that will affect psychomotor activity. But it does uh, wash out and is uh, not necessarily going to be reflective of cognitive and neurological Damage, and we have to be very careful about when a difference in cellular or network function is assumed to be damage. And these questions are really just the farthest thing from trivial. Throwing out in the popular press the idea that a brain imaging study shows some slight alteration in neural structure and that that means damage, it continues to propagate this tremendous stigma that prevents this medicine in important situations. So I'm, I'm going to review a, a lot of, and go into some of the deeper science here to justify some of what I've just said. I'm going to give you some background about these different ways that cannabinoids have to promote brain resilience and repair, 
And then I'm going to contrast that with some of the more, what I'm sort of referring to as the modern phrenology of brain damage. Uh, cannabinoids act to limit excitotoxicity. And this, some of this is going to be uh, supportively reiterative of Justin's talk. Um, they limit reactive oxygen species. They limit microglial activation. This is the immune system of your brain. They decrease pro-inflammatory cytokines. And these, this describes the innate immune response in the brain, neuroinflammation. And I'll go some examples there, but something I want to impart to you is that these days, researchers in chronic neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington's, depression, addiction, so much right now is being viewed as having a very important component of chronic neuroinflammation. And the research is very robust that the cannabis-derived cannabinoids are uh, mitigating neuroinflammation through these mechanisms that I'm highlighting here. They also can elevate uh, and cause vasodilation and increase cerebral perfusion, which is good for promoting recovery to injury in most cases. Um, and they stimulate the growth of new neurons in the brain, which is called neurogenesis and could have very important therapeutic implications. Um, I, I refer to this as a pleiotropic system of neuroprotection. Pleiotropy or pleiotropic mechanisms are referring to when a single sort of agent or, or gene, for example, contributes to a, a cause by multiple pathways. These multiple pathways to brain resilience and repair is a pleiotropic sort of reality of the endocannabinoid system that is remarkably replicated by the plant cannabinoids through overlapping but numerous to topics. Now, I have a little animation here to explain the excitotoxicity, uh, the effect of uh, endocannabinoids preventing against excitotoxicity. This is a little bit similar to, it, it, it's a more modern view uh, or a more uh, active view of a slide that Justin showed. I hope you'll humor me and allow me to do this. Um, if it will work, my mouse is not, oh, you're gonna, guide it for me here. I'll narrate this a little bit. I didn't make this animation. It comes from Istvan Katona and Tomasz Freund, very important endocannabinoid physiologists in Hungary. But it does come from some of the work that I was developing several years ago. Now, if you could hit, just hit start, this is just an animated view of an excitatory synapse where action potentials are arising and calcium is coming in and releasing the excitatory transmitter glutamate. Normal situation here. The Act, the synaptic cleft where one cell is driving the next. But what's about to happen is a model of an epileptic seizure. When you have seizure activity, the presynaptic axon coming from one brain area starts to get hyperactive. And this is the frequency, it's a seizure activity coming on. You get all this excess calcium. And as a result, lots more glutamate comes out and starts to spill over and hit these glutamate receptors that trigger well substantiated, understood cell signaling pathways that lead to the liberation of 2-AG, the endocannabinoid. 2-AG travels in this retrograde pathway that we described some 20 years ago now that comes back and acts as a circuit breaker, as these authors describe it. It acts to as an acute negative feedback. If you can go back to the uh, regular presentation now. Um, I think it's useful to sort of uh, show that kind of imagery and again to emphasize that this is as mainstream as science gets. And so endocannabinoids, this retrograde signaling mechanism is very important for understanding effects on learning and sensation and cognition, but it's very important for understanding that the endocannabinoids are a rapid break to too much excitation that can lead to seizures and toxicity in the brain. And THC replicates these endocannabinoids at the molecular level very, very closely. CBD also, as we know, blocks seizure activity in a lot of conditions, and the mechanisms are less clear. I'm not really going to take the time to talk about them. But excitotoxicity is not just dominant in epilepsy. It's dominant in stroke and head wounds and other situations. And many, many preclinical animal studies show that the endocannabinoid system are an, is an on-demand defense against excitotoxicity, as you've just heard. What other kind of damage occurs during the brain? reactive oxygen species. I show here the, the uh, citation of the much publicized uh, paper by Hampson working in the lab of um, 
of uh, Julius Axelrod, uh, this is the paper up upon which that research, they were granted a patent. The federal U.S. government has a patent on THC and CBD as neuroprotective agents, um, which activists in the United States are very keen to talk about because how can they say there's no accepted medical use when they've patented, the federal government has a patent for accepted medical use. Um, hypoxia and ischemia, glucose deprivation are important things that happen as a negative consequence of brain injury and disease, and the cannabinoids have these pleiotropic mechanisms. Oftentimes, researchers think it's through these other mechanisms, these other receptors that you just heard about, uh, but it's very exciting, and these cannabinoids can help. There have been many different studies to apply this to stroke models. And I just choose one that has a nice graphic here. I don't know if the, col if the color challenged will be able to read this, but this shows experiments, this is from an Argentina group, um, experiments using a synthetic cannabinoid that acts like THC, um, this ACEA, and the model is called me medial cerebral artery occlusion. They're, they're mimicking an ischemic stroke by clamping off the arterial blood supply to an animal for period of minutes and then letting it go again and then doing histology on the animal and you know quantifying the the area of infarct the damage from the stroke and what this evidence shows is that with uh, this stroke model and just the saline given you get a certain level of lesion in the brain if it's treated even post injury with the cannabinoid that infarct volume goes down, and in this case, they used an antagonist to block, uh, the, to do the opposite, and block the endocannabinoid system, and the damage, the extent of the lesion was greater. Again, numerous studies have actually shown this, but I chose one that had a decent, decent picture. And this also may be a little provocative, because you look at areas in the U.S. where uh, cannabis medicine is approved, and stroke isn't one that's being used. And yet there's a tremendous amount of literature to support it theoretically as being useful. But you do see public ad campaigns about stroke. You know, time loss is brain loss. You have a stroke, you need to go get it taken care of. Why is that? And don't you think that we, the phytocannabinoids, might help? The, the preclinical researchers do. With stroke, time is brain. That's another sort of uh, w way to talk about it. And that's because at the core of a damage, you get what's called the ischemic core, where you've had blood loss, hypoxia, and uh, damage. But over time, of a matter of days, or hours to days over the stroke, you get all of these processes, inflammatory mediators, leukocytes come in, microglia get activated, glia start to proliferate. And because of this, over this period of 24, 48 hours, the ischemic core turns into what's called the ischemic penumbra, which is really the extent of the damage of the stroke, and it's largely a product of the innate immune response in the brain. Well, you know, hopefully I've set up this a little bit for you to see where we're going. In animal models, when you add cannabinoids, cannabinoids are well understood to block all of these pathways, not all of, not some of them, all of them, these inflammatory mediators, the effects of these uh, uh, in a immune system. And so the outcome in animal studies is that it shrinks the level of the ischemic penumbra and the extent of the score damage, stroke damage. And this has been recently reviewed in a systemic review and meta-analysis by the lab of Saoirse O'Sullivan in, uh, in Nottingham. And they, I, I quote from this review paper, we selected controlled studies assessing acute administration of cannabinoids for experimental stroke. Overall, cannabinoids significantly reduced infarct volume and improved functional outcome in experimental stroke. The pleiotropic effects of cannabinoids on the ischemic penumbra and cerebral vasculature after stroke, combined with their excellent tolerability, which by the way is very well substantiated, make them promising candidates for future treatment. So I wonder how long it will be before we can set up well-designed trials in humans. And yet there is interesting sort of uh, uh, observational studies like this one looking at patients that were uh, admitted for an intracerebral hemorrhage, kind of a stroke, where patients that had higher levels of cannabinoids on blood analysis, and they're talking about THC here, had milder presentation of the symptoms of the stroke, the intracerebral hemorrhage, and less disability at discharge. Patients that had the higher level of, of THC in their bloodstream had lower levels of uh, negative consequence from the stroke. That's 
certainly not a causative piece of information, but it's very interesting. It factors into a whole other body of literature that I'm only just going to touch on with a review here by Shohami and colleagues out of Israel that endocannabinoids may be very useful for traumatic brain injury. And we have these very elaborate schemes from high-profile journals that reiterate the things that I've been talking to you here, that we have, in the case of brain injury, you get all these harmful mediators that are generated, and you also get the on-demand generation of endocannabinoids, which are the natural breaks for these pathways. And there is just so much research that shows this. It decreases neuroinflammation, it decreases excitotoxicity, and it starts to promote the differentiation of new stem cells and neurogenesis that can be part of the curative process. There's also this study I quote here from 2014 in The American Surgeon. This was in uh, uh, car crash survivors in, in California. Again, that positive THC, the more THC was present in a drug screen of victims of a car crash, were associated with decreased mortality. That is an increased rate of survival if they uh, suffered a traumatic brain injury. Circumstantial for sure, but interesting in that it coincides with the animal literature. This issue of cannabinoids and neurogenesis is very fascinating and well mechanistically understood. And the idea here again is that with brain injury, this is a review by Manuel Guzman's group in Spain, uh, with brain injury, you get this increase of endocannabinoids. And in these areas of the brain where you have these neurogenic niche populations where new neurons can be grown to support uh, resilience and uh, function, that the cannabinoids promote that as a natural response, an evolved response to injury and stress. The plant cannabinoids have evolved their own method to interact with us that seems to be very supportive of this kind of pathway. But so now I've talked a lot about some mechanisms of why that it is as mainstream as science gets that the endocannabinoid system is a system of neuroprotection, resilience to injury and uh, damage. How does it equate that cannabis use should be damaging to the growing brain? Well, we know that it does, it does influence brain development. And in animal models, uh, endocannabinoids are involved in neuroplasticity during development. There, is, there are animal studies where uh, mouse pups are given THC daily for weeks and weeks, and you look at the adult animal, and there are some problems with cortical development in those animals. So it's a legit question to ask, although you have to understand where the strengths and weaknesses of models are. You know, a mouse pup is born blind and naked one day, and less than three months later, they are fully mature and having babies of their own. Their, their brains are mature. And that accelerated course of development is very different from what humans have. And I don't think anybody who's supporting the use of cannabis in serious medical conditions, as diverse as they are, would promote taking a child and giving them a high THC concoction every day from the first day until their brain is mature, which is about 25 years old. That, so the models there don't always line up. But it is an important question, and the important question for medical ca cannabis is how serious are these risks to brain development, how big an impact is it, and how serious is it as a possible side effect of a vital medicine? Because we know that our healthcare system certainly uses many different medicines that have very pronounced side effects, especially when you're talking about things with seizure disorders, anti-cancer agents. We have to deal with a lot of toxicity. How does this measure up if we use the same sort of uh, standards to cannabis? Does cannabis alter the brain? This is really where the research goes. There's a, we're, we're going to see many more studies about this in the future because it is very in vogue to, to fund human brain imaging studies. There are the human brain functional MRI studies and other methods are very powerful now. And as a neuroscientist, a professor of neuroscience, I'm very fascinated by it, but it is oftentimes skewed by this negative bias that doesn't just come from the media, although it certainly does. And this is a result of one of the most prominent studies that got spread around the globe like wildfire. Harvard scientists studied the brains of pot smokers and the results don't look good. I'm going to delve into just a few of these studies uh, and then uh, review them a little bit and wrap up. In this study that was a collaboration by Harvard and Northwestern scientists, these uh, 
investigators found some small volume changes associated with cannabis use in users that were uh, not problematic. They were functioning college students and were supposedly sort of recreational users. And there, so there was no correlation to decrease in performance. And also, cannabis users were more likely to be alcohol drinkers in their study. They didn't fully disentangle that. Um, and that's a real problem. But some of what they showed, without digging too much into the data here, is uh, the, the only real thing that panned out with much of with their many tables of statistics is that there was an increased uh, volume of the left nucleus accumbens, a subcortical brain structure related to drug seeking and reward. And this is what it looks like, um, this increase in volume, and they made a correlation about the amount of joints smoked per week. Um, this has been pretty soundly attacked by uh, some data analysis experts, but that is where it rests. And then they also said that the right amygdala, this brain area involved in emotion and fear, for example, was slightly different shape. And this really standard had never been applied before to argue that this slight shape change they're able to see with these very powerful imaging methods would be associated with dysfunction. And there was no dysfunction in this study, but yet they said that it, this is not a, the, one of the senior authors, Hans Breiter, was quoted in a press release saying, these are not areas of the brain that you want to mess around with. Um, well. One of the gold standards in scientific research is if something is reproducible. And these authors from the University of Colorado engaged in the parallel study. They tried to reproduce this. They controlled for alcohol use, which the other study did not, in this, in nearly in, as much as they should have. They used similar, very similar methods, but had greater numbers and therefore greater statistical power. And they found no correlation between any of these brain structures and cannabis use. It was published in the same journal, the Journal of Neuroscience. It was funded by the same funding structure, the National Institute on Drug Abuse. They also, in, this, in the paper, Hutchison and colleagues, uh, tried to make a comparison of comparable studies that occurred in the literature. In this graph that they showed, uh, they're looking on the left side here are different published studies and all of these icons are reflective of different brain structures. And the point here is that if you look at any of these structures, like the blue square here, that's the uh, cerebrum, cerebellum, there are studies that show an increase in size in marijuana users and a decrease in size in another study. There is really a great disparity and functional brain imaging is sort of dealing with this issue uh, in the community about reproducibility, and it's an important one. They also, this is gonna be a lot of words for a slide, more than I normally do, but I wanna give them give their whole quote in context because they, they wrapped up this paper with a, a brazen, a statement that is, I, I think, really strong that you don't see in the scientific literature much. Clear evidence regarding the effects of marijuana in the brain and on health in general are important for informing the public and policy makers about the potential risks and or benefits of marijuana use. The press may not cite studies that do not find sensational effects, but these studies are still extremely important. While the literature clearly supports a deleterious short-term effect of marijuana on learning and on memory, it seems unlikely that marijuana use has the same level of long-term deleterious effects on brain morphology as other drugs like alcohol. And that's understated. I'm going to keep going then. But it, their statement was a little bit prescient because this first study has been very highly cited by officials of the National Institute on Drug Abuse. I see the director, Nora Volkov, and others refer to this paper as indicative of our slow path, drug control policy people in different countries refer to this paper as a real smoking gun to worry about, even though there was no functional disruption in these individuals. And the authors say things in the press like, this is not a part of the brain you want to mess around with. This study below that could not reproduce it has been virtually ignored by these uh, NIDA luminaries and others when they're referring to it. And I think that the funding structure of NIDA has an obligation if they're referring to this body of research and you've got these two head-to-head -head studies to convey both to the public. There are also uh, many other studies that have been coming out. I'm just gonna hit on a couple of them. Like uh, two appeared in the, in the 2015 October issue of uh, Journal of American Medical Association Psychiatry, looking at differences in amygdala volumes in cannabis users. 
saying they were attributable to common uh, factors that are genetic and environmental with little uh, support for causal influences of the cannabis per se. And those changes in amygdala have been seen in a few different studies that the amygdala volume it may go down with heavy chronic cannabis consumption started in youth. Another study in the same journal showed that early cannabis use and related to risk for schizophrenia was more likely due to other developmental problems and not the cannabis use per se. So while these are interesting and important study questions to ask, is there a risk for schizophrenia? Is there a risk for structural alterations in the brain? People need to understand, policymakers need to understand that the scientific understanding of this is that the effects are subtle if they're there. And we're talking about treatments for serious diseases. Here's a British study, effect of high potency cannabis on the corpus callosum, the white matter pathways that connect the hemispheres of the brain. And authors found that frequent use of high potency cannabis is associated with disturbed colossal microstructural organization in individuals with and without psychosis. So cannabis users had this slightly different microstructure of this white matter pathway. It was not associated with the outcome they were looking for with psychosis, but they still use, choose to use the term disturbed. Like there's a deficit there as opposed to just a recognition that it is different. You, males have smaller corpus callosal pathways than females in humans. Does that mean that males are disturbed or altered or dysfunctional? Or just that they have a different way of connecting their hemispheres? I think these are important things to think about. And in general, my critique of brain imaging studies and cannabis users are that you can find these brain structural alterations. It's of interest to me. It is. But they're typically in the absence of any clear functional consequence. And therefore, to interpret these differences by a default as a disturbance or a damage or that the brain must be compensating for the damage from cannabis is a reflection of the institutional negative bias, the negative bias that funds the studies in the first place and that supports and sensationalizes it, not scientific objectivity. <laughs> Thanks. As Justin did a better job than I will really, uh, talking another important issue is the question about uh, IQ, and one of the most prominent, highly uh, publicized studies came out of the Dunedin cohort in New Zealand. Uh, Meyer and colleagues published this paper that persistent cannabis users show neuropsychological decline, meaning a drop in IQ. It was covered all over that you get this irreparable drop in IQ from uh, cannabis use, and yet it is contrasted by other body of literature that fails to find drop of IQ. It's not something that's consistently replicated. I do have some conclusions of my own from that Meyer study because it is such a prominent one. Um, I have no doubt it gets talked about here in Australia. That, you know, to me, the risk of dependence and other adverse outcomes definitely center on very heavy use starting at an early age. You know, this IQ effect, if it's real, though it did not, it, it was critiqued by authors saying that they didn't control well enough for socioeconomic status, which definitely has, is correlated to poor IQ. Um, but nonetheless, we're talking about young people, kids under the age of 15 who start smoking high potency cannabis every day and they do it for years. And that is not a model for the therapeutic use that you're gonna hear talked about by physicians with experience with cannabis. It's not a model for what most kids need. Uh, and you know, maybe high dose cannabis is, is used for directly targeting cancer chemotherapy. But you know what, if you have a child with a devastating illness that is gonna take their life, I think you gamble that they might have six IQ points lower when they're 38, you know, should they be so blessed to get there. Um, and it also is important that, you know, we need to see it as, within the limitations of IQ as a measure of general intelligence. It's not the end-all and be-all of cognitive function. Um, we do need more studies, and they get interpreted in different ways. Here's another one I want to mention that was published a few years ago uh, in a group out of Texas. They showed that there was reduced gray matter in the bilateral orbitofrontal cortex in marijuana users compared with controls. And yet, at the same time, they showed an increase in the white matter that connected the hemispheres of these two orbitofrontal cortex from left and right. And that's shown here. This is a fancy map. Brain imaging is always more uh, manipulated than you realize if you don't know the field. But these 
hotter areas of cannabis is reflected here, showing this increased functional connectivity. So you get a smaller gray matter area in these areas of the prefrontal cortex that are involved with controlling behavior and impulsivity and could be very important uh, for, as a consequence, but they're connected more. And we don't know what that means, but I can tell you, you could look at the popular press around this when this paper came out, and some areas were like, oh God, it damages the prefrontal cortex. Now we know, here's solid evidence that cannabis use is gonna make you stupid. And you looked at sort of the, and you could look at the sort of pro-cannabis enthusiast literature in the States at the same time in the same paper, and they're like, hey, the jury's out. Cannabis use is good for you. It strengthens connections between the frontal cortex. They were talking about the same paper and, and celebrating it or demonizing it, the response. And this is from that paper, a fancy image of that connectivity. The takeaway is that there's lower volume of this prefrontal cortex gray matter, but greater functional connectivity. And I think, you know, it's an interesting finding. We don't know really what it means, but they interpreted it as compensation for damage or metabolic compromise. These people are compromised by using cannabis, so this must be a neural signature of compensation. And that is not necessarily the case. What about just saying that these individuals may be using different neuronal network computational strategies? We don't know. This area has been recently reviewed in a, in a systemic review uh, by, this is a group out of Brazil. This literally just came out a couple of weeks ago. I was per perusing it on the plane and stuck it in here because I'm cherry picking a few studies for time that I've understood well, but this is a good reference to look up that's looked very comprehensively at these issues, at least in adults. They looked at 56 studies after excluding a lot, and they show growing evidence of abnormalities in the hippocampus volume, they say, and gray matter density of cannabis users relative to controls. This is in the abstract. It certainly supports the idea that these aren't pro-cannabis legalizers writing this, and that the functional neuroimaging studies suggest an altered pattern of brain activity associated with cannabis use. Okay, that's measured, but also something to worry about. There were limitations of this body of literature. Most are cross-sectional studies, snapshot images. They don't infer causality well. There's an absence of standardized cannabis use patterns in these research studies and assessment paradigms of damage and the data analysis. And frequent use of cannabis is not always well controlled with the other use of other substances like alcohol in that one study I just described. So the literature is problematic also the length of abstinence period. A lot of these brain imaging studies, you're just sort of taking it on the user's word that they stopped using within the last 48 hours or a week, and there could be residual withdrawal effects or residual amounts of THC in the system that are influencing these structures. So it's, it's muddy, that field. And these authors concluded that it in general, the body of evidence suggests subtle changes associated with regular cannabis use and cognition, as well as in brain structure and function. That's what we're talking about. It's interesting and important, but we're talking about subtle changes associated with regular cannabis use, and that is presented as a huge insurmountable roadblock to getting access to patients from a medicine. Findings in these field concentrate on very heavy users and are unlikely to represent most casual recreational users and I think most like, unlikely to represent medicinal situations. In my perspective, brain morphology changes, highly reported, should not be uncritically interpreted as damage and we have to hold our policymakers to task on that. It reflects a deep institutional bias that continues to favor research that is aimed at uncovering hypothesized risks. Believe me, that's how you write the grant if you want to get it from the National Institute on Drug Abuse. That's their funding prerogative. And, these interp and interpretations that emphasize potential risks. These biases can and do shape public health concerns around medical access to cannabis. On the other hand, advocates should not flatly dismiss science that describes adverse outcomes. Adverse outcomes are there, but you need to build alliances with experts to provide critical and objective review and learn from new findings that could be important for the pharmacovigilance of cannabis as medicine, but identify those that are spurious and don't let them hold up in the way. And again, here's this word, pharmacovigilance is a, is a, a, a term to apply to continue making sure that drugs that are out there are, are safe.
and find problems that arise. And that does need to be applied to cannabis as new formulations, high potency oils and, and vaporizer pens with different substances in them. We need to study them, but we know that this plant grown straight from the ground is one of the most safest uh, pharmacologically active medicines that, that uh, we have ever known. Cannabis is a medicine of the present and the future, not just the past. Canna cannabinoids are neuroprotective. We should definitely unshackle research to really understand how and when. But it's not going away. This biological access between inflammation, neurogenesis, the gut health, the microbiome, endocannabinoids are so critically involved in all of that. And phytocannabinoids act in multifaceted, very similar pleiotropic ways as well that are very exciting. And I haven't even touched on this potential effect of terpenes, non-cannabinoid components of cannabis that may be interacting in other complementary ways. Dr. Sexton is gonna talk about that a little bit. And, you know, I use this term phrenology in my talk. Phrenology is a 19th century method developed by Franz Gall in Austria about looking at the contours of the brain and inferring mental function from it. It is now largely used as a, as a synonym for sort of junk science, though it did have contributional importance. The, importance, the thing is, what went wrong with phrenology, among other things, it, it wasn't just arbitrary. It was based on correlations observed between human subjects. But people who, practitioners who made too much of that correlation that they observed and misconstrued it as proof of causation and that that then became a confirmation of their preconceived hypotheses. And I submit that studies, for example, showing that a slight change in the concavity of a subcortical gray matter area that you can't even visualize without extremely sophisticated software and brain imaging, to construe that necessarily as, as justifying a preconceived view of the damaging effect of cannabis is not scientifically valid. And we have to check ourselves on these institutional biases and socially ingrained prejudices. They cannot be misapplied to the use of what we know is a very safe, very important, very real natural medicine, the reefer madness, pulp fiction of the 30s did influence our thinking, even in the medical and scientific realm. This is presented as the plain, uncensored truth. And if we think we're very far away from that, in many ways we are, but I think there's a lot of correlations here in these publications. Um, so with that, I will end, and thank you for your attention.